world. Joining us today from the heart of the Silicon Valley is a marketing powerhouse and visionary leader. He brings with him an impressive track record, most recently recognized as one of the CMOs to watch in 2024 by CMO Alliance. His strategic leadership has been instrumental in tripling enterprise lead generation, and his efforts have also earned him many accolades, such as being a finalist for the OnCon 2024 CMO Marketer of the Year and one of the top 10 marketers CMOs of the Year 2023 by On Conferences. Please join me in welcoming Eric Herzog, CMO at Infinidat, to the show. Eric, are you ready to get radically transparent with me? Absolutely, Jen. Thank you for including us. We appreciate you uh, recognizing Infinidat and let us know how we can help. Well, we're really excited to jump into this episode to have you on the show. You know, if anybody is following Eric on LinkedIn, who's listening in now, you know that we're in for a great episode. So I want to kick off, Eric, right? When it comes to professional challenges, you know, a lot of us maybe sleep very little, uh, maybe we sleep a lot, but there's always something keeping us up at night as marketing leaders. So I've got to ask you, what is keeping you up at night professionally these days? The number one thing I think that marketeers face is teamwork, both teamwork within the marketing function. It's very broad. Some people think what I call soft marketing, right? Digital demand gen, the website. Well, that's soft marketing. Then you have the medium channel marketing. And then the very technical side of marketing, if you've got the right focus on a business to business engagement, which is product marketing, solutions marketing, and technical marketing. So that entire gamut needs to work as a team, just like anyone in a professional sports team, would that be football, European style, American football, rugby, or any other team sport that you may see. That's what you need to do. And then on top of that, marketing needs to be part of the team across the company. Many times marketing is its own little silo and the marketeers think it's great if they've got a great ad or the data sheets are cool. What matters is, is the marketing helping drive leads, helping drive revenue, helping the sales team progress deals down the funnel? That's what matters. And people just do marketing so it looks cool and their ad is at the Super Bowl or their ad is at the Olympics. That's not real marketing. That's very fluffy. And that's not what sales teams need. And that's definitely not what CEOs want. They want marketing that helps drive revenue, helps increase profit, and helps them grow their business. That's what they need. And that's what CEOs expect from the marketing function. I agree with you 100%. I once heard that great marketing leaders or leadership rather come down to two things, people and math. So I want to ask you a people question, right? You mentioned, and, and we sure. see it, right? That marketing often operates in silos and nobody likes teams that operate in silos. How do you break down these silos especially between marketing and other key departments to make sure that those silos are not existent. Is it possible? So I'll do it two ways. So first of all, at all the companies I've been at, whether it be global fortune 500s, which I've been at five of them, or whether it be startups, which I've been at eight of them, <laughs> is that everybody works as a team. So for example, at Infinidat, I meet with my leadership team, me and every one of the functional leaders, every week. I do a one-on-one -on -one with them every week and the entire team meets every week. I did the same thing when I was the CMO of the IBM storage division, which if it was not part of IBM would be a $7 billion standalone company, but as part of IBM as part of a $70 billion company. And I did the same thing when I was at EMC, now part of Dell, when I was at EMC, we were a $25 billion company. So it doesn't matter whether you're a small little startup or a big company. So that's within the function. Okay, then I have regularly met with the sales leaders. So for example, at Infinidat, I meet with the CRO every Friday for a half hour. I meet with the two channel leaders, our channel leader for North America, for the Americas, and for EMEA and APJ, all three of us together, every week for a half an hour. I meet with all of the sales leaders who report to the CRO once a quarter. So I make sure that we do that. My team meets with their appropriate team. So for example, my channel leaders meet with their channel teams on a regular basis, usually at least every other week, if not once a week. They also happen to meet from a field marketing perspective with the field sales leaders. Again, at least every other week, if not every week. So I go out of my way and I've been a CRO before myself uh, five times. 
In fact, when I was at IBM, which is where I was until I, I've been at Infant now, at, been at that now for two years. But when I was at IBM, I was the CMO and the vice president of global channel sales. Okay. So I really know what it's like to make sure that everybody works together as a team, both within the marketing function, because I'm really a product manager who's learned how to do marketing. I'm not a marketing person. I'm a product manager. So specking products, forecasting, margin analysis, competitive, all the stuff that a product manager does in a high tech company. That's what I started at. And in fact, in every company other than here at Infinidat, I've ran the product management function as well as the marketing functions. So that's my background. So you've got to have that background and you've got to be working both A, within the entire marketing panoply right across. And you also need to do the same thing with the other teams, the sales teams. I meet with the product management team every other week, their entire team and my uh, product marketing team meets every other week. So that's what you need to do. And these meetings need to be short, disciplined, and orchestrated so you don't have you know, meeting mania, which is just a waste of time. Totally agreed. And I love that you called out marketing fluff. I think this is really important to call out, especially in tech. And as someone sitting in the Silicon Valley, right? So to be able to be radically transparent, kind of right, no marketing fluff. This leads me into my next question, right? And it's around speaking and representation. Because what we know is that oftentimes it's supposed to be in the organization that marketers are the best communicators and they're able to be the best representation of the organization, or at least that's the expectation. But it's ironic because we are starting to see that that's not always the case, that the marketers internally are the strong communicators. And I wanted to ask, why do you think that is, or what what do you think happens when it comes to marketing? Why are like why is the press not wanting to necessarily always speak to the marketers? They'd rather go to someone else, or they're not deemed, you know, the, the domain experts. When you could argue that we're supposed to have some of the best communication skills, you know, in the industry. So it's not just communication; it's communicating appropriately. So, for example. When I was at two of the Fortune 500 companies I've been at, I met several marketing people that barely knew what the company did. Interesting. They could be marketing shoes. They could be marketing automobiles. They could be marketing some sort of service, but they had no clue what the company did. So having been in product management where you need to be technically deep, you don't know what the product really is. How can you market it? It doesn't matter how well you speak, you come across as fluffy, not serious, not understanding how the technology works. So it's a bad representation of the company. And in fact, I have seen emails from press multiple times at multiple companies where we don't want to talk to the CMO. Now, my PR teams have gotten over that because I've been a senior VP of product management. I was IBM's vice president, business line manager, what they call product management back in the old days, running the business, responsible for the P&L. What are the products? What's the release schedule? Working with engineering. So once the press has seen that, then no problem. But many marketing people don't have that background. They truly are fluff marketing. So if you're in high tech, business to business, and you're marketing a service, you're marketing software, you're marketing a solution, whatever it is, but you could also easily market shoes or some sort of food product, you could work at Coca-Cola easily. You're probably not the right person to be speaking about that technology to the press, to the analysts, to the partners, if you're through the channel, to the end users, you know, because they'll see through it right away that you're technically weak and that doesn't work. So again, there's a commercial back in the States. I don't know if it was global. Wendy's, where's the beef? If you're going to talk, you need to be able to talk. And if you can't explain how your technology works, what it does, what are the technical advantages, what are the business advantages, how does it benefit the CIO, the CFO, the CEO, as well as the technical gurus of whatever that function may be, right? If you're doing accounting software like Oracle or SAP, why is it good for the accounts? You also have to be able to tell the software engineering team why it's good for them, because guess who's doing the work on the basis of the accountants and the finance team, the software engineering team. Well, if you can't talk about that effectively on how it benefits the business owner, accountants, the finance people, the CFO, the VP of finance, the VP of tax, and you can't tell the software 
the VP of software working for the CIO. And here's how we can get that out faster. Here's how you can customize. So if they want to do X, Y, Z on the accounts payable, here's how we can help you do that quickly. Well, if you can't do that, you're not a good speaker from a business to business technology perspective. You're all fluff. Yeah, no, we don't want to be all fluff. And it's interesting because we've had so many marketeers on this show. And I have to say, you're the first marketeer that we've had that has such a strong background in product management. Usually we see two paths, right? An in-house marketer coming out of, you know, university and they join an in-house team or, or an agency. So this is fascinating to hear, right? This kind of integration with product management background. And I think it's, it's extremely important hearing you speak about this, that, that marketing and product management are joined at the hip, especially for B2B tech. What's one piece of advice that you can share with other CMOs based off of your experience in product management that will help drive their teams forward? And I, I know we meant right, no fluff, cutting it out, but is this something that the organization can train? Is this a soft skill, hard skill? Like, or is it how we're hiring? How can we build stronger yeah, teams? I'd, essentially? I'd say it's a combination. One is about how you train. Okay. I have to have a master's degree in Chinese history from the University of California. I'm not a degreed engineer, oh, but wow. trust me, I can go in and present to any CIO about how our technology works. I can present to the VP of infrastructure, the VP of storage, and I usually can get through down to the storage admin, at least for the first, sometimes even the first and the second meeting. I present, can present to a CISO. Our products are imbued with a ton of cyber storage resilience and cyber storage recovery. In fact, we've won 18 awards wow. for that aspect of our storage technology. And trust me, I can talk about it all day long, credibly. But I got a mastery in Chinese history. I don't have a degree in computer science, in electrical engineering, in mechanical engineering. I'm not a data scientist, but I can talk the talk in a credible, realistic way. So you need to be able to train people for that. You need to hire the right people. I have never hired a product marketing person who didn't used to be in product management or a field sales engineer or solutions architect. Never. You're asking for it. Technical marketing, same thing. They've all been degreed engineers. They've all worked in the field or they've all been in product management, moving to technical marketing. And the same on the solution side. These are deep technical things that you need to have the right people to do. And it's pretty hard to train them. I just got into storage so long. I mean, I'm almost 70 years old. So most people who are watching this thing, you know, I was doing storage when they weren't even born yet. Okay. <laughs> so I've just got a long time. I've got street cred in this industry. I've won a couple of times lifetime achievement award in the storage industry, which is not a marketing award. It's a storage industry award. So, you know, I've been able to do it, but I've started a long time ago. Yeah. And so there's training an aspect to it, the right person. So for example, in a small company, not a big company. So if you're at a big company, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, IBM, you can hire people because there's training programs. Exactly. If you're in a small company like can fit it at, my dictum is nobody learns on my watch. Nobody. Because I can't afford it. Now, when I was at IBM, did I have people right out of college, whether they be degreed engineers doing product management or learning product management or someone out of the business side learning marketing? Sure, because they got training programs at IBM. When you're in a small company, you don't have that and they can't be learning on your watch. And that's a problem. And there are many people that try to, especially in the startup, oh, we don't have the big money. And, uh, we'll get, get someone on the cheap. That's not the way it works. I believe in what I call the superstar factor. You have people that could do the job of two. If you got to pay them more, you just save the company money. So if you take it and you can hire someone at 150000 for a certain function and, and they could do the job of two people and you'd have to pay them hundred k you just save the company 50 k Not to mention the stock you're saving because you're giving stock to one person versus giving stock to two if you're in a small startup company. So I think that there's ways around it in both the training side in how you hire and it depends on the size company like i said in a small company nobody should be learning on your watch it's a recipe for disaster however at a big company where there's formal training programs for all kinds of things that's a different story and since i've done both yeah. you know when i'm in the big company i've had people in fact when i was at ibm i mentored 15 people including three other vice presidents were my mentees wow okay now by the way i mentor four people at infinidat okay okay we're small so I'm still doing it, 
but it's not the same as when I was at IBM or EMC, which is now part of Dell, you know, they were huge companies. So, you know, to be mentoring 10 people, 15 people, no big deal. When you're a small company, you can't do that. You got to have people that know what they're doing because they can't be learning on your watch. It's a recipe for disaster. So hire the right people, depending on what type of company you're in. When you've got the right training facilities, the big company, go ahead and leverage those. But even then, you still need to hire the right people, yeah. right? You need to have a mix. If all you do is hire people out of college, and trust me, I went to college. I had to get my first job too, okay? So, but you can't just hire a bunch of newbies. It doesn't work. It doesn't work no matter what you do. So you have to have that right mix of experience, deep experience, middle experience, and newbies in a big company. In a small company, if you don't have deep experience, worst case, mid experience, and that's not only technically, but that's also in the function. Yeah. Okay. If you need someone for channel marketing, you don't want to hire someone who is demand generation and never worked in the channel in a startup. If you're in a big company, you could take someone out of the demand gen team, move them to the channel marketing team. They can make not too many mistakes. Everyone needs to try. You need to learn. But if they make a million mistakes in a small company, you're dead. Yeah. Right? So it kills you. So you can move people around and do things at a big company where you've got infrastructure around those individuals that you can absolutely not do in a small company. You just can't afford it. You don't have it. You have to move quick. You have to be nimble. And you got to do it right because usually when you're a small company, you're competing against the Godzillas and the King Kongs of your industry. So yes. they've got huge teams. You don't. And you've got to beat them on the field of battle every day to win deals, to grow the company, and to be profitable. And if you're private, to try to go public or get acquired at a great price. That's what you have to do. That's what the CEO expects. And marketing can be critical to that if marketing does the things properly. Agreed. I could, that was so well said. Uh, so listen, last question for you. What sure. is one thing that you can tell us about yourself that we actually cannot learn about you from your LinkedIn profile, asking AI or Google? Let's see. I would say that would be that I was a jock in both high school and college. I was an all-star baseball player and wrestler. I got a couple wrestling scholarships to universities. I did wrestle in college until I uh, hurt my knee very badly and that ended my wrestling career, but that's what I used to do. So again, that's why my analogies are often sports analogies. You need to win on the pitch. You need to win on the, on the floor. You need to win on the field. You need to win on the mat. That's what you need to do. You need to win on the ice, although I can't stand hockey. So <laughs> that's what you have to do. And business is a team sport. And I always say, Business is a team sport. That you can find if you Google me, me saying it's a team sport. Well, it's a sport. Okay. Now, by the way, there's real, real fallout. Unlike if you're playing baseball or soccer or American football, there isn't fallout if you lose the game, except when you're a professional. And right. then guess what? You lose, That's your job. But for people who are not professionals, it's for fun. Okay. And business should be for fun. But it also means sending your kids to college paying your mortgage, having money for retirement when you're too old to work, or you're just like me, you never retire since I'm <laughs> almost 70. So, but you've got to make sure that, you know, that's what you wouldn't see from my, from looking at my LinkedIn. It doesn't say former collegiate wrestler, former all-star high school baseball player on my LinkedIn profile. It might say it if you Google me, maybe, but I don't think so, but you'd hear it's a team sport. Eric, it was an absolute blast getting radically transparent with you. Thank you for spending time with us today. And I look forward, you know, we had a lot to talk about. Maybe we'll get you back in to talk about another aspect of marketing. You were fantastic. Thank you so much. Sure. Anytime. Thanks for having us. And uh, whatever you need, let us know.